It's the Daily Doug. Hey, y'all. Welcome back to the Daily Doug. Thanks for being with me today. You have arrived on a Friday, and I am very excited to bring one of my favorite classical pieces to you on this Masterpiece Friday. We're looking at Fanfare for the Common Man, and we're going to take a look at two versions. First, the original from Aaron Copland, one of the giant short compositions of the 20th century. And then we're going to take a look at the version done by Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. And uh, a lot of people have been asking me to to take a look at uh, specifically the ELP version of this. But I thought, you know, if we're going to spend some time taking a look at Fanfare for the Common Man and what ELP did with it, which I have not heard yet, um, I want to start with the original so that we know what the source material is. So I'm going to talk for a few minutes about the original, and then we're going to listen to it. It's only uh, about three and a half or four minutes, y'all. And then we'll take a look at ELP's version of it and spend a little bit of time together on a Friday, and it's going to be just marvelous. So thanks for being with me for this episode. So, Fanfare for the Common Man is by Aaron Copeland. It was written in 1942, and uh, it was written for the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra. It is scored for four horns, four French horns, three trumpets, three trombones, a tuba, and then three uh, percussion players, one playing timpani, one playing bass drum, and one playing the tam-tam, otherwise known as a gong. And uh, the, the backstory of why it was written is quite fascinating, friends. The Cincinnati Symphony conductor at the time, his name was Eugene Goosens, and he was uh, an older gentleman by this time, and he uh, was an English conductor and a composer, and he had been active in England for some time uh, being an associate at the Royal College of Music. He was a wonderful violinist. He was a great composer in his own right and conductor, and he decided that he was going to do conducting as his primary outlet artistically. And while in Britain as a younger uh, director, he conducted the British premiere of Stravinsky's Rite of Spring with Stravinsky in attendance. And uh, by the time we get to the 20s into the 30s, he uh, comes to America to conduct for many years, most notably at the Eastman School of Music and at the Cincinnati Symphony, where he succeeded Fritz Reiner. Okay, so uh, big shoes to feel, uh, fill. And for the 1942-43 uh, the season, okay, think about the timing of this. He commissioned 10 different fanfares from American composers to honor the war effort as each of their orchestral concerts began. So for each of the orchestra concerts during that year, they would start with a little fanfare from an American composer, and this honored America's entry into the war. Goosens had done the same thing back in Britain during uh, World War I, and he had quite a bit of success with it. Uh, not only putting some uh, dollars in the hands of composers, but having a way in his orchestra concerts to pay homage to what's going on outside for a little bit of time, and then you go on with your evening. And um, after all of this, uh, all these years later, Copland's composition as one of ten uh, is the only one that remains popular in the standard repertoire. And uh, it was written, uh, like I said, in response to U.S.'s entry into World War II. And Aaron Copeland took inspiration from the current Vice President, Henry Wallace, who in a famous speech had proclaimed the dawning of the century of the common man. So with this inspiration in mind, Goosen, the, uh, the orchestra director, decided to program the premiere for March 12th of 1943, and he chose that time of year because Americans are acti actively paying their taxes during this time. Our tax deadline is in April. So he wanted to honor the common man at tax time. Pretty cool, right? So here's something that I want to show you first. I know I'm talking a lot, but we'll get to the music, y'all. I need to show you this because this 
is a scan from the Library of Congress. And this is Copeland's original manuscript in pencil. And it's just four pages here. Here's page one. And then we get page two, page three, and page four. And then, and then it, uh, no, one more, page five, sorry. Uh, it's five pages long. And then we end, right? So that's his own uh, stuff. And uh, the, uh, the copyright is from 1944, and it's registered to the Aaron Copeland Fund for Music. And this is used by permission uh, from Boozy and Hawks, who is the publisher and licensee. So I want to take just a minute to show you a couple of things that are included here in the um, in the score. So you'll notice that he's not writing for everything at the beginning, uh, just the ones that are playing. So he's got just the percussion, the timpani, the bass drum, and the tam-tam. And this pattern where it's got a boom, and then a boom, boom, right? We remember that, we've all heard that. By the, by the time it starts again, this first time, is shorter and then it becomes a little bit longer and then a little bit longer still so it's got this little uh sound to me of immediacy and then it sort of just echoes and, and backs off a little bit and then this main theme punches right in and it's every <laughs> trumpet player's um you know privilege and nightmare at the same time to play this it's so exposed uh, all three of them have to play this in unison, and uh, you you try not to be the one that cracks. It's a really beautiful open uh, melody that Copeland a type of melody that Copeland is known for, and uh, just just arpeggios here coming up. Uh, this, by the way, huh, it's part of the thing of 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 reading music. Uh, the trumpets are written. You see here B flat. It says. These are written as of transposing instruments. So although this looks like GCG, it's sounding a, a whole step down. It's sounding an F to B flat to F. This piece is in B flat. And uh, because of that, since the trumpets, and the B flat trumpets sound down a whole step, uh, since the piece is in B flat, the trumpets are written in C so that they sound the right thing, All right? We can talk about transposing instruments at a different time. But if you look at just the shape of it, it's it's an arpeggio, it's fa la do going up, and then do mi sol going up. It's it's open chords, and really nice open spacing that he's got. He brings in the horns. The horns are in a different key. The horns are in F. They transpose down a fifth. So this F from uh, that's written here sounds a B flat. So this is B flat to F to another B flat. They're just playing along with the trumpets. Not like it's parallel motion, but the notes are moving, arpeggiating within a certain chord that's happening at that particular time. And that's why you get a combination of parallel fourths and parallel fifths, sometimes parallel sixths, uh, as he writes this secondary line with just the horns and the trumpets. The horns come back in here. We get the low brass that comes in down here. Uh, what else is going on in here? Uh, here's one spot where the timpani is playing this arpeggiation from an F to a B flat up to an F. That mimics that very first uh, outline of the ascending melody. We've got some fun stuff. Divided brass trumpets, three of them uh, divided here. Uh, horns divided up as well. We move into a full brass choir. Uh, he's got triple F here. Pesante. I believe is what that says and uh, that's an Italian term as I recall that means it's heavy it's profound it's ponderous uh, that's passante right and so we get these nice uh, tenuto marks he's like yum pom pom each of these has to have their own sort of flair to it each of these quarter notes has their own bloom and their own reason for being in that melody. We get some fun uh, chromaticism here. I'm just looking and seeing what he's doing here. Ah, yes, yes. So like this A flat chord resolves up to B flat major, and then an A flat to, woo, is that a D flat? Yeah, D flat to, that's an F chord uh, in an inversion it looks like. So, uh, yeah, that's cool. Um, 
and I'm just remembering this. It's been a while since I heard it. And then all of a sudden into Sharps, um, A, and then it ends on a big D major chord. Spoiler alert, y'all. It ends on D, a major third away from where it started. It ends more bright and brilliant, and that's the reason why it sounds that way. We're going most of the time just kind of around in B flat and then a little bit dark and then it gets back to where we came from and then brighter and then brighter still yet and then we're going to land on that D major chord it's beautiful I thought about listening along to it while playing the score but I found this really beautiful version of it by uh, the Gavant House Orchestra and this is one of the world's leading orchestral ensembles. They're based in Leipzig, Germany, and this is beautiful. We just need to see and listen to this one. This one was published to YouTube in July of 2021. I think I'm finally ready to listen to some music, y'all. Are y'all ready? Okay, let's do it. Fanfare for the Common Man, the Aaron Copeland original version played by the Gavant House Orchestra from Leipzig. Off we go. not parallel motion y'all they're just playing in the chords as they go still lands on b flat advantage of the spaciousness and the power of these instruments. There was that timpani going up. flat to B flat gets brighter, D flat again, brighter yet, F, even brighter, A, F to D, Whew. it's an amazing, amazing piece, I am well acquainted with it because uh, I'm a uh, an alum of Westminster Choir College and I taught there for several years and this piece with uh, the the brass uh, eight part brass and 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 percussion um, more than eight part brass uh, uh, was always performed at our graduation ceremonies in the big cathedral on the Princeton University campus and 
You knew it was time to matriculate when the fanfare for the common man started playing, and it was always so, so special. I miss hearing that. I miss those ceremonies. Uh, but uh, let's move on and see what Emerson, Lake, and Palmer have done with this. So this is from Works, Volume 1, their fifth album, released in 1977. I've got my vinyl of that out there. And uh, as we recall, with this album, each member of ELP got a side to play with. right? Keith recorded his piano concerto. Greg recorded, uh, I think, five songs. Uh, that he co-wrote with Peter Sinfield. Uh, Carl recorded, I think, five or six pieces, including a few arrangements of some classical tunes. And then on side four, the group presented two sort of full band tracks, uh, including Fanfare for the Common Man and Pirates. And as I was getting ready today, I thought, you know, it's fitting that this cover by ELP is the one that we're up to today because the last time that we featured ELP on the channel, we heard Pirates. So we're finishing out this side from, from works. That's pretty cool. Today, uh, they are no stranger to adapting classical works. Uh, they're they're uh, great fans of classical pieces. Uh, one example is uh, The Hoedown from Aaron Copeland, same composer from their 1972 album, Trilogy. And so uh, as the story goes, from what I can find out, they were recording in Montreux in 1976, and Keith had been toying around with uh, this piece, The Fanfare by Copeland. And while Keith was playing it, uh, Greg improvised this little shuffle uh, bass pattern, and then Carl jumped in, and it was sort of this magical version that manifested itself right there in the studio. And as they played it and worked it out, the recording equipment was rolling. And at least according to Greg Lake, from what I could find, that's the version that's on the recording, on the album, right? The first time that they really played through it. And there you go. It's kind of lightning in a bottle. Uh, and so we fast forward several months. By the time that they were on their North American tour in 1977 in Montreal, uh, they arranged for their equipment to be set up in Olympics uh, Stadium uh, while it was empty. In fact, I think it was snowy from, from what it looks like here on the, the, the thumbnail. And they arranged for a videographer to come with them. And so they ended up doing four takes uh, with the videographer filming each musician individually for the, for the duration of that take. And then once with the like just getting the whole band and then they splice together the footage and the end result is what we're going to see right now. I believe that the audio is from the actual studio recording. So Keith Emerson is on his Yamaha GX1 polyphonic synthesizer. Uh, Greg Lake is on his eight string bass and Carl Palmer is playing drums and percussion. I cannot wait to watch this and see this. Uh, this is really what uh, we've been leading up to. So here is ELP doing their version of Fanfare for the Common Man. Off we go. Step higher. It's a pretty decent trumpet sound, though. It's a big stadium. Three little guys at one end of it. Snow on the ground. <laughs> Close. So he's using real timpani sticks. Okay, we're getting groovy with it. <laughs> wow, it must have been cold. Look at look at their breath. It's got the voicing right. Huh. Ooh. Like that. 
it's so funny, but it oddly works. It's rhythmicized, but it's pretty um, pretty close. Just rhythmicizing it. But Brighter, then it ends instead of on a D, it ends on an E. So they're going to riff in E for a while. I need that coat. It's not Copeland's music anymore. It's... Okay, so that's taken from it. Some of those voicings. But it's more like just an open groove. big fan of these open voicings that Copeland was using in a piece like this. Remember Tarkas? A whole bunch of open fourths. Those fourths and fifths. That is interesting. Feels like the synthesizer's eating something.
So the melodic contours are derived from Copeland's piece. They're definitely making it their own. <laughs> Does that end it? Oh, shocks. That can't. Oh, man. I kind of faded out right there at the end. I need to figure out if that clipped a little bit. I, I've got the source recording so I can go back to it. But how fun. How fun. Uh, ABA structure never never fails, y'all. ABA. You start with something, you go to something different, you bring back the original thing. It makes it easier to grasp as a listener uh, in, in one sitting. Hmm. This has been fun. Uh, this version of uh, Fanfare for the Common Man was quite commercially successful. It made it all the way to number two on the UK charts, and it became one of the band's biggest uh, hits in the later part of their career there in the 70s. And th this isn't lost on me. Copeland was still alive when they did this. Copeland didn't die until 1990. Uh, <clears throat> so the band needed to get his permission to publish their recording. And uh, According to their manager, he called him up and he seemed like a nice cordial guy. He's like, send it to me. I'll listen to it. And he sent the recording to Copeland and come to find out Copeland loved it. How about that? So uh, I have a radio interview uh, or a portion of it where Aaron was talking about this particular thing. So he remarked about ELP's version of Fanfare for the Common Man like this. <clears throat> this is interesting. He says, well, of course, it's very flat, flattering to have one's music adopted by so popular a group and so good a group as Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. A lot depends on what they do with what they take. And naturally, since I have a copyright on such material, they're not able to take it without my permission. So that in each case where I have given my permission, there was something that attracted me about the version that they perform, which made me think I'd like to allow them to release it. And then he goes on to say, of course, I always prefer my own version best, but what they do is really around the piece, what you might say, rather than a literal transposition. In that particular case, I allowed it to go by because when they first play it, they play it fairly straight. And when they end the piece, they play it uh, fairly straight. But what they do in the middle, I'm not exactly sure how they connect that with my music, <laughs> but they do it some way, I suppose. But the fact that at the beginning and the end is really the fanfare for the common man gave me the feeling that I ought to allow them to do it as they pleased. And so there you hear it from Aaron Copeland himself. 
it's a beautiful thing to me, friends, when you understand a little bit more about the history of a piece, the people behind it, the um, the agendas of the people behind it, uh, the 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 time period, the the current events, it's it's kind of a, a love story to the power of music. This is lifting is seeking to lift up the common person as the industrial revolution and kind of globalization and travel and the whole thing has elevated the more common person, me included, you know, uh, to be able to more fully participate in democracy and life and, and the whole, and that whole thing. And it's amid the, uh, the war and, uh, the the folks in Cincinnati were like, we we want to do something. And Eric Copeland's like, yes, I'll be happy to. I'll take inspiration from what the vice president said. And I'll write this little, uh, you know, three and a half, four minute fanfare for, for brass and percussion. Uh, no keyboard instruments, no strings, no, no woodwinds or anything. It's just a fanfare. And it is just brilliant. It caught on and... Uh, 30 something years later in the 70s ELP doing their thing and leave it to the mind of Keith Emerson and they uh and in his brilliance really to pull that f out of Copeland's arrangement and put it in a different key and rhythmicize it like that not only did they rhythmicize it they put it more in more of kind of a common metrical structure as well to so that it can appeal in a prog rock setting. But uh, like Aaron Copeland said at the beginning, at the end, that's pretty much the fanfare for the common man. And then it's a whole bunch of ELP around it. And that makes for a fun Friday, doesn't it? It makes for a fun anytime, but definitely a fun Masterpiece Friday. And what a Masterpiece Friday this has been. It's been a real privilege to talk with y'all about fanfare for the common man, an absolute classic. Uh, of the 20th century repertoire that uh, is still uh, beloved today. And I like the ELP version too. So I'll get my, my works album out and play that side. Side four sounds like a fun side with pirates and with fanfare for the common man. Maybe I'll listen to that uh, later on tonight. But I believe that is all for now. I thank you very much for being with me. It's been a wonderful week. We will see you next time on another edition of The Daily Doug. It's the Daily Doug. Welcome to the Daily Doug. The Daily.